started a series a few weeks ago about counting the cost, or sorry, about the church. And today we're going to talk about counting the cost, counting the cost. Have you ever applied for a job, but then when you went to the interview, you didn't really know what the job was for? I hope you haven't been in this situation, uh, but I have. It was kind of embarrassing, but (laughs) uh, the situation was uh, I just graduated college and the Lord brought me back home through a series of circumstances and I was trying to figure out what the Lord was wanting me to do for for a job and so there was an opportunity to apply to a job at the school and um, my family was connected with the superintendent at the time and and, or the assistant superintendent, so he kind of uh, of aligned the interview, but I didn't really know what the interview was for. I just went to the interview, and uh, when I got there, I was like, so what's the job? <laughs> so, um, it was actually for a teaching job at the school to teach like some kind of health class, and uh, so I went through the interview, and I thought it all went well, but then a few weeks later, I got a call and said, you know, that the job had been terminated. There wasn't enough kids that signed up for the class to, to teach it. And so um, that kind of fell through. But at any rate, the lesson was you should probably do your research about whatever job you're going to do before you actually go to the interview. Um, That's just good practical advice. But it's a spiritual lesson as well. You know, the spiritual lesson is to count the cost before you partake. To count the cost, to do your research, to know what it is you're getting involved in, know it is what you're getting into, what you're signing up for, before you actually sign up for it. And we're going to turn to Luke chapter 14. We're going to read verses 25 through 33, where Jesus addresses this very subject about the cost of being a disciple of his. And he gives that a, a good list for us of a cost of being his disciple, and we need to count the cost ourselves. So if you would stand with me as we read God's word today, starting at verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, Such a person cannot be my disciple. Very strong words from Jesus here. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or, suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Father, as we come before you, we pray you would make your word very clear to us this morning. Help us to be receptive to whatever you have, Father. And I pray you would use me as your tool, your vocal cords this morning to speak your truth and your gospel to us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, following Christ is not easy. Being a church member is pretty easy. However, being a God-honoring church member is not quite so easy. Because you can be a church member and just sit on a pew and not do very much. All the churches all across the United States have a lot of those. It's not real hard being a member of a church. But if you are going to honor God with your life and with your membership, it takes a little effort. It's difficult. But before we can even become a member of a church, we must accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. A few weeks ago, we 
gave some qualifications for church membership here. We have four qualifications. Number one, we must accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. Number two, we follow that with believer's baptism. Number three, we must take or make a decision about becoming a member. In other words, we do not force membership on anyone. You must make a decision about becoming a member. And then number four, the acceptance of the other members must accept you as part of the congregation. They must vote on you, in other words. Say, yes, I agree, this person should be a part of our fellowship. Those four qualifications, but I really want to hone in on that number one today. Because before we, have, we become a member of a local church, we need to first become a member of the body of Christ. And by accepting Christ as our Lord and Savior. There's a lot of ways that Scripture describes this. And Jesus uses the, the vernacular this morning of being a disciple. He says, if you want to be my disciple, you must do XXX next. So being a disciple is being a Christian. I got this quote for you. It says, there is no such thing as a Christian who is not a disciple of Christ. There's also no such way to get into heaven without being a disciple of Christ. And so what Jesus is addressing here is of supreme importance for us. If you want to be a part of the Christian fellowship, we must be a disciple. If you want to get into heaven, you must be a disciple of Christ. And Jesus here lays out for us the cost of being a disciple. What does it cost us to become a disciple? And there's, there's some strict responsibilities of being a disciple. So here's some cost that we should count before we would accept the position of being a disciple of Christ. Number one, to love God so much that other relationships look like hate. Look at verses, verse 26 primarily. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate their father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, do you think that is what Jesus means? That you need to hate your mother and brother and sister and father and wife and kids? And if you don't hate them, then you can't not be my disciple. Does that compute well with you? <laughs> is that really what Jesus is talking about? Well, probably not, because that would be uh, negating, contradicting other pieces of Scripture. For instance, you know, to honor your father and mother is one of the Ten Commandments, right? In other places, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, we get instructions about husbands should love your wives as Christ loves the church. So, even just those two commands would be negating what Jesus appears to be saying here, literally. And then Jesus would even have contradicted himself, because if you look in John chapter 13, verse 35, 34 and 35, says, he says, I give you a new command, love each other, and by this everyone will know that you're my disciple. So Jesus gives the command that we are supposed to love one another, but then he goes and says here, well, if you don't hate them, then you cannot be my disciple. It seems like there's a bit of a contradiction here, don't you think? But is this what Jesus really, really meant? I think instead, Jesus was probably giving an exaggeration. He was using an exaggeration to show the importance of our relationship with God. He was exaggerating the point here. And by doing so, he was painting a comparison look at this jesus was painting a comparison between a relationship with god and a relationship with others and what's the comparison here notice there the types of relationships he uses in the comparison what are the relationships it's father mother brother sister wife children even your own life these are the closest relationships that we have here on earth so Jesus was comparing the closest relationships we have here on earth 
to our relationship with God. That's the comparison. Our closest relationships on earth and our relationship with God. All right? He was comparing the two. So he wanted to compare the, the strongest relation, earthly relationship to, the, to our relationship with God. And if you were to graph this, I don't know if anybody's a math geek in here, but if you were to graph this on a scale, we have the love for God and our love for others. And Jesus was comparing our love for God should be so far above our love for others. So my question to us today is how much more do you love God than others? How much more do you love God than others? Do you love God more than you love any other human being on this planet? That may be easier said, but my second question to that would be, how would you prove it? Now, Jesus was also painting a contrast. A contrast between love and hate. We would say love and hate are opposites, right? Loving and hating are opposites. And there would be a great gap between love and hate. Almost an infinite gap, if you will. Look at the graph here. They go in opposite directions. There's a great gap between love and hate. The distance between love and hate is almost unfathomable. You might say it's an infinite gap because they extend in opposite directions. Well, in the same way, the distance between our love for God and our love for another human, even the closest person to us, should look like the distance between love and hate. That's how much we should love God more than any other person on this planet. Jesus, Jesus was not advocating that we should hate those closest to us, but that we should love Him infinitely more than the closest person to us. In fact, the way we show love for God, ironically, is by loving others. <laughs> There's your twist. The way we show love for God is by loving others. You know, but the gospel writer Matthew helps us understand this passage from Luke. And in Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 and 38, Matthew says this, quoting Jesus. He says, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So there, the difference between those two content, between Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel, we see that Luke was probably translating the literal words of what Jesus actually said, but Matthew was translating what Jesus actually meant. You see the difference there? Jesus was meaning, if you love anyone more than me, you're not worthy to be my disciple. If you want to be my disciple, then you must love me supremely above all. And how easy it is for us to idolize different relationships that are close to us and put them above God in our lives. It's so easy to do. But God says, no. I am supreme above all else. You are to serve me first and foremost. But then he says, so the question I want to ask us to ask ourselves is, is this a cost that we are willing to pay? Of having Christ as supreme in our life and the number one relationship for us. The second cost is this, to carry our cross and follow Christ. To carry our cross and follow Christ. Now I want you to put yourself into the minds of the disciples who are listening to this. Because this was before Jesus went to the cross. And what was their perspective of the cross? The cross to them was a symbol of execution. A symbol of embarrassment and shame and guilt and crime. And Jesus was saying, you need to bear your cross and follow me if you want to be my disciple. That would have been like a, do what? 
kind of reaction from the disciples. You want me to do what? I don't understand. Carry the cross. You want me to be shameful? You want me to be guilty? You want me to be put up on a pedestal and, and shamed above all the crowd? Is that what you want, Jesus? Essentially, yes. Are you willing to be looked upon as dumb? Are you willing to be looked upon as stupid? Are you willing to be looked upon as a symbol of shame and guilt and even a crime? Because in many of our cultures and many of our societies today all across this planet, Christianity is illegal. You'd be considered a criminal if you were to be a Christian. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, it's going to require being willing to be shamed by the world. Because the world's going to think you're a fool, that you're ignorant, that you're a bigot, that you're intolerant, that you're unloving. Are you willing to count this cost? You're going to be considered to be a criminal. Are you willing to be persecuted for what you believe? Warren Wearsby says this about, about carrying your cross and following Christ. It says it means daily identification with Christ in shame, suffering, and surrender to God's will. It means death to self, to our plans and ambitions, and a willingness to serve Him as He directs. Are you willing to pay this cost? You know, Jesus preached this same message to thousands of people. But you know how many people actually He ended up with? <laughs> when He was actually standing on the cross. And being hung there, how many were left? Everyone deserted him. Are you willing to carry your cross? Jesus could have given them, because he had power, he had popularity, he could have given them a message that appealed to them. He could have amassed so much crowd and popularity and power. And to really take over the Roman government. He, he could have done that. But he chose to give him the truth. Because he wasn't interested in building power here on earth. He was interested in building a kingdom in heaven. A kingdom that will last forever. And that kingdom in heaven will only be filled with true disciples of Jesus. Not fake ones. Not ones that are just disciples on Sunday. Not ones that just go to church every now and then. Not the ones that, you know, are just lollygagging in their faith. But the true, devoted disciples of Christ. That are willing to toe the line. That are willing to pay the cost here. Those are the ones that Jesus says, you are my sons and daughters. And there are no exceptions. There's no such thing as living a basically good life and being good enough for God to accept you. You'll never be good enough. There's no amount of good works that will be qualifiable enough for God to accept you. Because even if you just have one sin, that negates all the good things you'll ever do. That sin must be atoned for, and you can't atone for it yourself. It is only through Christ. Are you willing to pay this cost? Number three. Count the cost before we decide. And in this, Jesus gave two analogies that describe counting the cost. We're going to count the cost before we decide. What are the two analogies? Number one, building a tower. Building a tower. Of course, you would not begin to build a building without first researching the cost. How much is it going to cost me to build this building? How much is it going to cost me? Because otherwise, if you start it, but then you say, oh, wait, I don't have enough money to finish it, it's going to invite ridicule and mockery, right? That's what Jesus says here. Only those who are truly invested will see the building to completion. And if they're truly invested, they would have counted the cost beforehand before they even started the project. So that's one analogy Jesus talks about. The other analogy is about a king going to war. A king going to war. The king, there was this king, 
And there was an, an attacking king. So he was about to be overrun by this attacking king. And then he had to decide at that moment, is, okay, I have 10,000 soldiers. And you can back up one. <laughs> I have 10,000 soldiers. And this army that's coming against me has 20,000 soldiers. Do I have enough power with my 10,000 to overcome the 20,000? Well, if I don't, I can't just sit back and do nothing because this an army is invading our territory. I must send a delegation of peace. My two choices are I can either fight or I can send for a delegation of peace. But either way, I must make a decision. And that's the picture Jesus was painting because both of these analogies are two sides of the same coin. One side of the coin is about, oh, both of the coin represents the gospel of Christ. One side of the coin says, you have the right to choose whether or not you want to build the tower. You have the freedom of choice to do it. But the other side of the coin is, you must make a choice. Because there is a coming king who is invading the territory, and he is the king of kings and the lord of lords, and he's going to come, there will be an end, but there's an opportunity for a delegation of peace. And God gives us the terms of peace. And it's actually very simple. You receive my son as your lord and savior. And the terms of peace, as Jesus spells out here, what does it mean to really receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, is in verse 33. What does he say? Verse 33. We must surrender everything we have. That's the terms of peace. But there are two costs to consider here. Two costs to consider Number one, we have the immediate cost in this life to follow Christ. The immediate cost in this life to follow Christ. What's the immediate cost? Well, to follow Christ in this life, it's going to cost us everything that we've mentioned here. We've got to surrender ourselves. We've got to surrender everything we have. We have to be willing to count the cost and be persecuted for our faith, be willing to, to suffer are we willing to count the cost? That's the cost of, this, of the immediate, right here, right now. But there's a second cost I want you to consider. The eternal cost in the next life for not following Christ. The eternal life in the next life for not following Christ. This is the, this is the cost that truly needs to be considered. Why? Because... This cost is so much greater. You know, the immediate cost to us for following Christ here on earth, there's an end to it. Right? The day we die or the day Jesus comes back to get us. There's an end. Well, the eternal cost in the next life, if we don't accept Christ, there is no end. It's an eternal cost. And this is what we talked about as hell. Hell is the eternal cost for not accepting, Christ, not accepting Christ as your Lord. Is the eternal cost greater than the immediate cost? I would submit to you that yes, it is. But are you willing to pay the eternal cost and give up the immediate cost? Or are you willing to pay the immediate cost so that you don't have to pay the eternal cost? Either way, somebody's going to pay. Somebody has to pay because our sins deserve that there be a payment for sin. But like I said, Jesus gave us the terms of peace so that we do not have to pay this eternal cost. And that is only through Christ. And the, the peace treaty looks something very similar to this. Verse 33, number 4 here. We must surrender everything we have. Jesus says this, In the same way, those of you who, are not, who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. 
That's the immediate cost. We're giving up everything we have. But what are some things that we have that we need to give up? I'm going to go quickly through these. This comes from Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Jesus was asked the question, what's the greatest command? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and your strength. Second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, what are some things that we have that we need to surrender to God? Number one, a heart that is fully surrendered. We need to surrender our heart. Now, I'm going to lump in here because the gospel writer Mark says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. I'm going to lump heart and soul together because they are referencing very similar things. But the heart is the center fold of your being, where all your desires come from. Everything you do flows from your heart, the center fold of who you are. And that needs to be surrendered to the Lord. To have a heart fully surrendered to the Lord means that we lay down our pride. And our perceived right to ownership of our lives. And we allow Lord, the Lord to change us from the inside out. To create in us desires that look like Him. To desire what He desires. So sometimes to change our heart, God must strip us from everything that we hold dear. We, we are stripped away from all the things that tether us to this world. Because he wants us to be only tethered to him. So sometimes he must strip away all the dangerous influences in our lives, like bad company, money, job, our health even. So that we rely solely and dependent on him, a heart that is fully surrendered. When we have attached too high a priority or have allowed too much attention to anything in this world, that thing becomes the object of God's jealous wrath. Did you hear what I just said? When we have attached too high a priority or have allowed too much attention to any one thing or anything in this world, that thing becomes the object of God's righteous wrath. Jealousy. I want to emphasize righteous jealousy here. Here's a note about God's jealousy. God is not wrong in being jealous. It's wrong for us, but it's not wrong for Him. But why is that? Because He knows He is the greatest good in this world. And everything and everyone else is always subpar. No one, no thing can match up to the goodness that he knows he possesses. And for us to find fulfillment in anything else besides him is to leave us with something less than the best. Therefore, God wants to attack the very things that we are holding out as idols in our lives to prevent us, that are preventing us from experiencing him most fully. He wants a heart that is fully surrendered to him. Number two, he wants a mind that is fully surrendered. A mind. Are we devoted to using our minds to serve the Lord by growing in knowledge of him? How much time do you spend in God's word? Are you growing in knowledge of him? Are you devoted to studying? Maybe God has equipped you with some skills and talents on a certain subject matter that he wants you to grow in so that you can be a good teacher, so that you can tell others about this good truth. Not only should we grow in knowledge, but he also wants to think, wants us to think rightly. He wants us to think lovely and praiseworthy thoughts. Paul says, think about whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is noble, whatever is excellent and praiseworthy. Think about these things. Because that's what the mind of Christ looks like. And how much of our thought life is just impure and corrupt and selfish. God wants a mind that is fully devoted and fully surrendered to Him. And then lastly, we need to have strength that is fully surrendered. Are we using our energy, our time, our resources, our money for the glory of God's kingdom? Now, we need to 
take time to rest our bodies, yes. Our bodies are, are feeble things. We need to take time to nourish our bodies. I will say this. We need to remember that a fit body can do more for the kingdom of God than an unfit one. As long as it depends on us, we need to care for our body and do what we can for this tool, this weapon that God has given us for the kingdom of God. Your body is a weapon in the Lord's hands. I hope it's not a defective one. <laughs> but as long as it depends on you, you continue to use it and to glorify the Lord with it. Now, there may be some things that are outside of our control, some health considerations that are outside of our control, but those things are in the Lord's hands. We just need to do well with what we can control. Amen. Now, part of surrendering our strength is also surrendering the things that God has given us, the things that uh, maybe are more worldly driven like money, our job, our talents and skills. But about surrendering our money, this does not mean that we need to give all of our money to the church. If the Lord is leading you to do that, and you do that. But that's not necessarily what he's asking. We just need to understand that your money is not your money. My money is not my money. If I'm a follower of Christ, our possessions, all of them, are God's. Amen? And God has given us the responsibility as managers to do well with the money. But the manager does not own the money. He just organizes the money. Right? God has given us the responsibility to manage His possessions well. Ultimately, everything we have is His. Are you doing well with what God gave you? Are you doing well with what God gave you? So we probably need to ask ourselves a few questions when we spend money or spend our time somewhere. Is this what God would want me to do with this resource? Is this what Jesus would do with this resource? Is this what Jesus would do with my time or my energy or my wallet? Because we need to be surrendered with everything we have. Being a genuine, God-honoring disciple of Christ is of supreme importance. Jesus made it very clear. If you're not willing to count the cost and lay down your possessions and lay down your whole life, you're not ready to be my disciple. But it is a choice. It is a free will choice to follow Christ. But it is one not to be taken lightly. In other words, in the words of Shakespeare, he said this, I think it was Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. Is that Hamlet? Come on, Deborah, you got to do better. I thought you were a teacher. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to be or not to be, that is the question. Do you want to be a disciple or not to be a disciple? There is no in-between. And again, I would like to iterate, reiterate the coin of decision. The king is coming, whether we're ready for him or not. But he has sent a delegation of peace to us, and his name was Christ. And if we receive him as our personal Lord and Savior, we can be a part of the kingdom of God where there is true freedom, where there is true joy, where there is true happiness. And there is nothing else that can satisfy like Christ. Amen. Father, as we come before you, we ask that you'd be with us and continue to use us, convict us of sin, draw us closer to you. You guide us in every decision we make. Help us to be filled with your spirit, with every action we take. And Father, I pray for anybody here this morning needs to receive you as their personal Lord and Savior, that they would be bold and be willing to step forward and to receive you. And I pray uh, for those that couldn't make it this morning, God, we pray that you would help them uh, to want to be here, Father. For those that are traveling or having health issues that couldn't be here, God, we pray a special blessing over them. 
but also uh, for those that just didn't make it because they didn't want to be here, Father, I pray that you would just burden their hearts to want to be a part of the fellowship, Father. pray that you bring conviction over this congregation, over this community, about sin, Father, that you would draw people to you. For those that, that have, for years, have, been, have convinced themselves that they are saved, but they're really not, Father, I pray that they would come under conviction. For those that are far from you, God, you would draw them closer. God, I don't know what you're doing in the lives of the people here. But God, I trust that you are continuing to work. And you just help us to be faithful servants of you. In Jesus' name, amen.